We're back on track, so I'll invite um, Caroline Saunders from Lincoln University, and just picking up on the issue of uh, well-being economics, which I'm very much looking forward to hearing. Hi guys, gosh, how do you follow that? I mean, amazing presentations this morning, and we just had um, three wonderful presentations, and, and you know, there's no sex in here, I'll tell you that for now. Um, Rise to the challenge. Rise to the challenge, okay. <laughs> Wellbeing economics, I suppose, fair enough. <laughs> okay. um, so it's a real privilege to be here, and thank you very much, and thank you for those that helped us on, on this journey. It's kind of strange being here because I was on the Royal City Council probably around 10 years. I think I was probably one of the longest serving members of it. I was on the building committee for this building, so it's really great to be back here with another hat on and just see how that's developed. Okay, that's me. Um, my passion is that nothing from New Zealand or in New Zealand should be low value. Everything should be high value, high environmental value, high cultural value, high social value, high economic value, and we can get win-wins across that space. And that's sort of been my passion since I was generously adopted into New Zealand in about 1994. Um, so... Starting with the mihi, and this is where my cultural values, my, your cultural values might drop a bit, but let's give it a go. Enga tangata e tane, tenakoto kata, kanui taku mihi kia koto ai tenora, ke ti mihi aho ki ti mahranga o nai iwi katoa, tenakoto, tenakoto, kiora, tata, kata. Kiora. <laughs> Um, so I've been privileged to be the boss of um, the um, Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit at Lincoln University for nearly 20 years, and we get up to all kinds of mischief. And our passion is um, to provide leadership and research for sustainable well-being. And I've been working on sustainable well-being really all, all my career in various places. And in ver but and also, now, as, as just said, Norman just said, you don't do it alone. And in fact, what's great, I don't do nothing. I get the glory and they do all the work. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the two founder who came with me today. So Professor Paul Dalziel, Professor of Economics at um, Lincoln University and the AERU. And he is actually responsible for making me do the mihi and teaching me to do it and also putting together this PowerPoint. So thank you, Paul. And then we're also very privileged to have John Saunders with us. And John is a great member of the AIU team, disappears off to the OECDs and does all kinds of fancy things. But is also my son and also going to provide me my first grandchild, I hope, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, Kiora, John. <laughs> OK, we were founded in 1962 um, because the um, cabinet and the New Zealand government are a bit nervous about the UK going into the EU. Don't tell them we've come out. <laughs> we might be disbanded. <laughs> um, so, and it was on this triple helix approach, university and industry government to foster innovation. And that's something we're quite passionate about is bringing industry, ourselves, um, from the university and the government together to see if we can make innovation and make changes um, across society to look at the big problems. Um, now, whew. like other people, you could talk about all kinds of things you've done in your research, but Paul, who wrote the reference for me and helped put together my um, application to become a, um, a fellow, highlighted three pieces of work. And the first of those was the food miles work. Now, you get on with your career and you do all these amazing things, or maybe not so amazing, but you've got all these big projects you're doing and stuff like that. And then one comes along that's sort of littleish and, you know, and it gets blown up and it becomes global. And the food miles was one of those. And it was an issue coming out of the UK saying that um, food that travels further is worse for the environment. And of course, um, although we tried with the Canterbury earthquakes, we couldn't be New Zealand much closer to the UK. And so we did the food miles report. And nobody was more pleasantly surprised to find that food from New Zealand was better for the environment than food from the UK. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against local food. Or, or you know, there's all kinds of... But it took, nearly took two years of my life away, that, defending the report. I was hated in the UK and loved in New Zealand. Although you have many things in your career when you're playing with journalists. And so I've had a few here where um, one was, it's not often you get 
the right to reply to an article. And there was an article going by a master's student from the University College of North Wales saying that I was a charlatan and I should be, you know, I knew nothing about Welsh agriculture and how dare I, you know, do this report. And it was great plea. I wrote, I did my undergraduate degree in agriculture at the University College of North Wales. So there. <laughs> so, you know, you, you went out some. Um, so we showed that it was a lot about the environment. The other one was that I, I was getting a lot pillared by the press um, from the UK and that. But a guy from Timaru Herald said, said, can I come and interview you? And I went, oh, yeah, that should be pretty benign. He said, I also write for the UK's Farmers Weekly. And I went, oh, God, no. And he said, you taught me countryside management in the UK. Oh, did I pass you? <laughs> so that comes around and gets you. Now, that report, as I said, got us a lot of attention in New Zealand. And it got me a, 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 to the boards of the big companies like Fonterra, Silverfern Farms. So they all wanted me to come and talk to them and say how wonderful they were, which, of course, you did and all that stuff. But I also kept saying, well, you've got to think about how you're producing your food and what it's doing to the environment and culture and social. And they went, oh, shut up, Caroline, get back in your box. We don't care how the food's produced. India and China are our main markets, and they care nothing about that. They just care for cheap protein. So we looked at each other and took a deep breath and thought, let's fund a little project and go and find out. And we did. And I could put lots of results up, but this is one of the earliest slides, and it just resonated to me exactly what came out. And then we went back and took this back out to the big companies, and we've been having this journey for over 10 years now with lots of research, trying to change the culture in our agribusinesses in particular from a low-cost culture and high output, more grass, more cows, more grass, more cows, to a high value culture where we do excellent food, excellent kai, but it, it, it honours the cultural and the social and the environmental attributes of New Zealand. And so there's just two bits about the slide I want you to point out. So I was told I was too pommy, and the poms are only ones who care about the environment. Well, if you look at the willingness to pay, that's how much extra you're willing to pay a premium for a product. If you look down the China and India column, almost without a doubt, those percentages are way above what the UK are willing to pay. So don't tell me those guys don't care. They care more. And that's come out again and again in our research. And um, the bottom two lines just show how much they're willing to pay a premium for foreign origin. China will pay a premium for foreign, probably a little bit lower now, but a much bigger premium for New Zealand. And India doesn't would discount for foreign food, but will pay a premium for New Zealand food, and the UK doesn't give a toss. So, you know, it was trying to change this vision that we could, we could have that win-win. So, it's all very well for me to go out to the agribusiness sectors and say, there's prizes out there, you can get more if you've got good environmental, social and um, cultural attributes on that and we are we really lucky to work with John Reed at the NITO Research Centre where we're really looking at Maori credence attributes and how they might be celebrated in market as well but and if we don't have to bring that value back to New Zealand so we've also got work looking on global value chains making sure that that premium and those values come back and it is it's the shared values across that chain that really really matters um, it's been used around a lot so we like to think it's had impact. Um, it was behind the Taste Pure Nature beef and lamb campaigns, been used for the Trade for All Advisory Board. It's used by Ashore Qual to, on their Insight programmes and their QR codes, been used by Sinlate um, and other um, agribusiness. So that's sort of the day job. But what over, overhangs all of what we do is this well-being economics. That's almost a subset of it. So Paul, who's a sucker for punishment, decided to publish a Brid Bridget K. Williams book um, called Wellbeing Economics. Just ask me, you can have a copy. Um, and um, that, that went down very well. And then I was over in the UK and a UK publisher tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, would you like to do one for the UK or an international audience? And so I went back to Paul and said, would you like to do it, Paul? And he said, yeah. So Paul, um, we did the book together. And Paul did most of the work. But if you want to slow a slower book down, get your elder son, John's my younger son, who is a philosopher in Durham, um, to join the team. That's Joe. Because he pushed us every little bit about our underlying philosophies and that. Um, so I think it shows the enormous contribution science makes to um, sustainable well-being. And one of the things that we're really trying to push with the New Zealand government at the moment, with mixed success, um, is this importance of new knowledge. And I really appreciate the presentation early on today. You said knowledge has to be shared. 
We shouldn't be protective of this knowledge. It has to go out there and it has to go between generations. And this is um, reflected in, in one of the most up, more up-to-date, but not that up-to-date, don't ask me about treasury, um, endogenous growth theory which um, concludes is that the only way to get sustainable productivity through growth is through new knowledge. And so the Productivity Commission's report, it's not really there. We, new Zealand, we flip back to new widgets. We want a new widget. We don't think about this core knowledge that is so essential. And new, the Royal, new knowledge is what the Royal Society facilitates and produces, and it's what you guys produce. And so... Let us try and make that step of journey and get there and make sure this knowledge is celebrated, used and shared. So thank you very much for the contribution of the work and thank you again to my new whanau. Kia ora. Thank you.